privilege to uh, read a few things to you. Now, I must preface this. I cannot put the love in the, the names that I'll mention. Miss Jeannie had way. Every, every family member that she mentioned, she said it just her special, her tenderly. She was very dear friend to me as well. <clears throat> I found a purple notebook. <laughs> How to keep in the tradition of the future. <clears throat> Jeannie Regina Wester Heaven. Lovingly known as Jean. Jean was born April 11, 1933. Was the second of four children born to Pensy and W.W. W. Wester. She was born in Inwood between Grand Ridge and Sneeze and named by her father. She attended both elementary and high school in Grand Ridge, from which she graduated in 1949. Jean received her AA from Chipola Junior College and her BS in elementary education from Florida State University. She also did postgraduate work at the University of Texas in Denton, Texas, her teaching career began at Dell Wood School many years ago. She later taught in Sneeds, Grand Ridge, Offord, Malone, Mariana, and in Jacksonville. Jean accepted Christ as her savior at an early age and served him faithfully all the years of her life. As a resident of Harbor Chase assisted living in Tallahassee, she was a real prayer warrior after her body became frail with Parkinson's disease and diabetes. Despite her severe tremors, she continued to play the piano for the Sunday afternoon church services. She loved to travel prior to her health failure, and she visited several countries. The thrill of her life when she earned her pilot's license and was able to fly small aircraft. <clears throat> Jeannie was predeceased by her parents, Petsy and W.W. W. Wester, a sister, Rebecca Harrell, and her brother, Jack Wester. Two nephews, Murray and Gregory Harrell, and a grandson, <coughs> Lucas Paul Pelt, affectionately known as Luke. A half-brother, Emmett Wester, and three half-sisters, Ellie Wilson and Nanny Chan excuse me, Chancy and Annette Evis also predeceased her in death. <coughs> Jeannie's children, grandchildren, and great grandchildren were indeed the life of her life. She is survived by her son, Joe Pelt, of Broken Arrow, Oklahoma, two daughters, Penny Edward, and her husband, mm -hmm. Taylor. <coughs> and Jeannie Maria Sam Runfalo and her husband Aaron of Quincy. A daughter in law, Barbara Pelt of Sneeze. She is also survived by her sister, Miss Billy Dixon, and a sister in law, Nell Buster, both of England. Her grandchildren include Rebecca Guy of Slidell, Louisiana, Jason Van Pelt and his wife Wendy of Pensacola, Rachel Pelt of Sneeds, and Jeremy Edwards and his wife Christy of Inwood, 
Joseph Edwards and his wife, Barbara of Lake Butler, and Tears of Conrad and her husband, Brandon of Tallahassee. Great grandchildren include Gavin, Caleb, Jordan, Connor, Guy, and Gracie Knight, Kaylee, and Gabriel Van Pelt, Luke Pelt, Jr., Kayla, Desiree, and Jonathan Edwards, and Levi Conrad. <coughs> A host of beloved nieces, <coughs> nephews, cousins, and friends survive her as well. And just one note, the family will ever be grateful to the kindness shown by the loved ones at the staff of Harbor Chase, Tallahassee Memorial Hospital, and select specialty hospitals. I was trying to decide which stories to tell you. I have got a passel of stories. And the older I get, the more stories I have, and the longer it takes to do things. But I'll only give a couple. <clears throat> I knew Miss Jeannie when um, <coughs> she started Alford School. <coughs> and you probably don't know this, but she was a very ripple, I mean, a frugal woman. She counted every penny twice before she spent it. I forgot how to say the right word, I'm sorry. <coughs> but we were talking one day, and she says, I've got my um, route all marked out to get to Alford School. She didn't want to go any farther than she had to go. She came out on Highway 90. She, would, she said she went to uh, Mariana and uh, went down the interstate. She <coughs> made out south of Cottondale, and then she wasn't on Alford. That's a pretty good route, Miss Jean. But she was so pleased that she figured that out because it was <coughs> along the drive. <coughs> now the one story, <coughs> her daughters really helped me out in this one. And they might not even know it. She had just turned 72. It seemed like it was just last week. <coughs> but she, it, I had been over to, was over visiting her at Harbor Chase. <laughs> and um, I guess I got three stories. I'm so sorry. Mm -hmm. I'll insert the third one quickly. She always wanted a copy of my family's pictures so she could pray for them. And just about a month ago, we had lunch together, and I gave her the latest update of our seven grandchildren, and uh, our, it was a family portrait. But um, around her 72nd birthday was when I saw her at her home, and she says, do you know what I want to do on my 80th birthday? <clears throat> no, Ms. Jean. I want to go up in a hot air balloon. <laughs> Will you go with me? <laughs> I remember doing a series here one time, and I, I showed pictures of hot air balloons in um, New Mexico. That's where they have their big tournament or whatever they call it. And I said, if you make it to 80, I'll go with you. Oh, was mercy. Well, girls, thank you so much. For her 80th birthday, they saved me and took mom up, or let mom go up in an airplane, which she flew herself on her 80th birthday. That's the kind of a lady she was. She was a tough old bird, if you excuse my friend. And of course, she was real passive. She never got her way on anything, <laughs> never. But, I, oh, there's so many stories. And recently, as about a month ago, she was telling us she was still playing the piano with Harper Chase. And she was already ill then, 
we could we could tell she was quite ill. She was extremely quiet, but she was not exactly her nature. But we got together and she had lunch. And there was some more. And I could think of many more stories, but I'll stop with that. I was asked to read a, a verse of scripture, or actually a passage of scripture. And this is the, the church Bible here, and it's a Holman Christian Standard Bible. And the caption over the scripture, were, um, Romans 8, 31 to 39, says, The believer's triumph. Doesn't that sound right? The believer's triumph. She's not shaking anymore. She's not hurting anymore. She is just in a glorious state with her loved ones and with her Savior. Please listen as I read this scripture. Romans chapter 8, verse 31 to 39. What then are we to say about these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He did not even spare his own son, but offered him up for us all. How will he not also with, his, with him grant us everything? Who can bring an accusation against God's elect? God is the one who justifies, who was the one who condemns. Christ Jesus is the one who died, but even more has been raised. He also was at the right hand of God and intercedes for us. Who can separate us from the love of Christ? Can affliction or anguish or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, because of you, we are being put to death all day long. We are counted as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than victorious through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will ever have the power to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. May the Lord add his blessing to this word. The family has asked that we sing a hymn, and um, I am so glad you asked this lady to play. You blessed my heart. Thank you for giving your gift this morning. Amazing Grace. Miss Billy, do you want to sing the whole or the whole song? You better grab the book then. Hymn number 104. There may be a verse you don't know. Maybe a couple of verses you don't know. Only five verses then.
to wrap on for the show this morning. And I certainly want to thank the pianists and our soloists for their contribution as well. And I want to thank Miss Jean's family. Personally, I thanked them last night. Uh, but I want to thank them again today personally uh, for the opportunity to be here. There's a, a multitude of pastors that would uh, love to have this opportunity today that have ministered to this family over the years. Uh, so it is indeed an honor that they would have me to come and share with you this morning uh, and this time with Ms. Jean's home book. And I want to thank you. I know that uh, some of you have expressed uh, your love and care for uh, Miss Jean's family the last few days, maybe in the way of food, I understand there's a meal uh, in the fellowship hall. Uh, so you've expressed it in food and flowers and other tangible things. And believe me, you, uh, knowing this family for four years, I know their heart, and they will try in every uh, way possible to acknowledge your kind act of, of goodness towards them for the last few days. But if by chance of error, uh, you never see that, uh, you take it from me, uh, they are more than grateful that you have ministered to them uh, in the last few days. Uh, when I think of Miss Jean, uh, Miss Bailey and I were talking yesterday, there's just so many words that, that come to mind. There's just some things that all of us know about her. You know, she was loving and caring and, 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 and patient. And, but I told Miss Bailey yesterday, when I come by the house, coming in from South Carolina, uh, Miss Jean was just a gracious lady. Uh, that was the word that, that best described her for me. Miss Jean was just, just that. Uh, every time that I would come back to this area, and, uh, you know, I've, I've never lost my contact here. I try to come back often because uh, this entire area has been so good to me over the years. But every time that I would come by, i come back, I would always make it a point to go by and see Miss Jean if she was home at that time or if she was at Harbor Chase. And she and I would just again revisit all of the things uh, that was uh, going on in our life and had gone on in our life. Occasionally, we would go out and, and eat lunch, and uh, so on and on I could go uh, about the bond that Miss Jean Pelt and I uh, have in Christ. Uh, as I said yesterday, uh, when I went by Miss Billy's, uh, she began to tell me about some of the things that happened, and she had been in touch with me previous to yesterday, of course, and uh, she began to talk about these multiples of two. Okay, so this is for Miss Billy, for no one else, okay? But she talked about these multiples of two that, of course, started in 08 with the loss of, of her mother and then uh, her loving husband, Brother C.A. in 10, and then her brother Jackie and then in 12 and now in 14, her sister. But Miss Billy, I want to tell you something. The Bible says that there are ministering spirits sent from God, ministering angels. And I know you've told me that you're the first of the four born, but God has left you here for a reason. And you've accomplished much of that, but I want to let you know, when 16 comes and goes, I'm going to remind you, you're still around, okay? <laughs> you still have a ministry to do, okay? But God's not through with you yet. But I shared with Miss Billy, uh, and I should not tell this in the in front of, I know there's three preachers here, the, the gentleman with the funeral home told me he was a retired preacher. Uh, so maybe I ought not tell this, but they say confession is good for the soul and bad for the character. But I told Miss Bibby yesterday that um, in my ministry uh, there was one flaw, and that is that I, I never took any RE courses. I never got into religious education. I was a theology major, and I just stuck with that. And so uh, the negative side of that was that I never learned anything about, never learned how to plan or execute or direct. I certainly never learned anything about counseling, but now Miss Jean taught me. Miss Jean taught me one thing, and that is she taught me how to be a very good listener. Have you ever heard the term, and this, I'm going to outdate some of these younger folks, okay, but have you ever heard the term attached at the hip? I, I tell folks that's a great description of my relationship with this, with this, with this entire family. I think most of you know, or some of you may not know, but I came to be the pastor of Cypress Baptist Church in 1979, and the Westers and the Dixons and the Pell family uh, was a living example to me and my late wife and then my nine-year-old son. They were a great example of me, to me, of what the Bible says in Matthew 25, 35, I was a stranger and I took you in. You was a hunger and I fed you and you was a thirst and I gave you drink. That was the way that this entire family has been to me. I used to quote 
that I got from Miss Jean many, many years ago in a sermon a few weeks ago, Penny. When Miss Jean and I would engage in conversation, and we so often did, uh, in fact, I can, I can remember the name of that sermon that I preached was Climbing Out of the Valley of Despair. And by the way, one of the reasons that I use that word climbing in that message is because it's not always easy to, easy to get out of the valley of despair. Mm -hmm. It's not always easy to get out of the valley of depression. But I can remember so often Miss Jean would say to me, Brother Bobby, if I could just get back up the basement level. You know, God bless Miss Jean's soul. These pastors know as well as I do. But Miss Jean is just one of those people that just took everything to heart. I thought this morning, uh, uh, Penny and Sam, about what old Paul said when he wrote in 2 Timothy 4. He said, I fought a good fight. I've, I've, I've finished the course. I've kept the faith. And henceforth, there's a, a, a home laid up for me in heaven. And, and that's a wonderful description of Miss Jean because she was a lady that never let go. She, she kept her faith strong. And that's what helped her continue to the very end. Now, I could go on and on and on about my ministry to Miss Jean, but I tell folks my ministry, of course, is to the living. And so let me read a verse of Scripture to you. It's found in Ecclesiastes 3. It says, To everything there's a season and a time to every purpose under the sun. And in the remainder of chapter 3 of Ecclesiastes 3, in the remainder of that chapter, there's 28 functions of life that is named. And they're paired up, there's actually 14 pairs. But it's no accident that the first pairing says this in verse 2. There's a time to be born and a time to die. Because you see, those two set the parameters for the other 13 pairs of the things that come about in our life. A time to die. Now you know and I know that death is not a popular subject. I seriously doubt that there have been very many uh, bestsellers that has ever been written about death. But death is a reality. I want to share something with you today that you know already, but I think it's a great place to remind people, Reverend Harm. We're running a race. And we call this race the race of life. In fact, the Cancer Society, which I'm an avid supporter of, has a slogan, the Relay for Life. But I want to tell you something about this race that we call the race of life. It is a race that we cannot win. It is a race that we will not win. Because we're running against death. Now again, I thank Miss Billy for keeping me informed of what was going on over the past couple of weeks and, and few uh, days. And there's no doubt there were some times when Miss Billy felt like that Miss Jean was going to l lose the race of life sooner than she did. But listen to me, God who is, the Bible says, the giver and taker of life, needed mercy to Miss Jean and let, her ha let us have her just for a few more days. Hebrews 9.27 says, It is appointed unto man once to die, and after that, the judgment. The Bible says in Romans 6.23, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. I was sharing with uh, uh, the pastor a while ago that here with the representing uh, the funeral home, and I was sharing with him that I've been retired from the regular practice for about uh, 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 12 years now. And uh, one of the reasons I did that other than failing health was it gave me an opportunity to preach more revival. And sometimes when I'm preaching revival, I, I preach a message entitled From Life Through Death to Eternity. And what the Lord Jesus Christ does there in Luke 16, He pulls back the curtain of life and He teaches us some very valuable lessons about death and eternity. And one of the things that Jesus, that Jesus teaches us about death is this. Actually, there's three things. Death is inevitable. Death is irreversible. And death is impartial. 
Friend, listen to me. If the rich man had had a chance to do it all over again, he would have did it different. In fact, I'm not going to preach that message, but in that message, he cried to Abraham. He said, Oh, Father Abraham, would you please send a witness to my brothers? I have five brothers and they're lost and I don't want them to come into this terrible place called hell. But it was too late. He was in hell. I was sitting this morning very early at the home of, uh, of some more of my folks that, that took me and Chuck like a, a little uh, a, a, a roosted hen, Brother Earl and Miss Jackie Carroll's house. I spent the night with them last night. I was sitting there this morning preparing, uh, working on my message for tomorrow morning in Cottageville, South Carolina, where I will, will preach. And I was reflecting and I was thinking about some of my Bible heroes. And I tell folks of all of the heroes in the Bible, I, I think my favorite would be King David. And I think one of the reasons that I tell folks that King David, if you read about him, he had more hang-ups than AT&T did. I mean, he was just, his life was a mess. He, he just had so many problems in his life. You know, most people think about David, and they think about David and Goliath, or David, uh, David and Bathsheba. But there's another more encouraging story in David's life. And that come about at the time of a tragedy in his life. You remember what it was? David's child got sick. And the Bible says that David wouldn't take a bath. David wouldn't eat. David wouldn't go outside. David just completely was absorbed with depression. In 2 Samuel 12, David learns of his child's death and he soon ends that depression. And you remember what he says? He cannot come back to me. But I will go to where he is. Amen. You see, friend, let me tell you something in closing today. Miss Jean Farrell won't be back with us. Ever, ever again. But do you realize today if you know the Lord Jesus Christ is your personal Savior, you have an opportunity to go where she is? Isn't that a wonderful thought? She won't be back with us. No matter how much we desire it, no matter how much we might miss her. But let me remind you of something. She won't be the same as Jean that left us. She won't have that glucose monitor with her. She won't have those tremors. She won't have those times of, of being anxiously nervous. I said this to Miss Biddy in prayer yesterday. She'll be happier and healthier and more at home than she's ever been in her entire life. I want to read you a poem. I'm sure that some of you have probably heard it before. And it's entitled The Dash. And I think it's so fitting. Excuse me. For Miss Jean. It said, I read of a man who stood, who stood to speak at the funeral of a friend. He referred to the dates on a tombstone from the beginning to the end. He noted that first came the date of a birth and spoke of the following date with tears. But he said what mattered most of all was the dash between the years. For well, that dash represents all the time that she spent alive on earth. And now only those who loved her know what that little line is worth. For it matters not how much we own, the cars, the house, the cash. What matters is how we live in love and how we spend our dash. So think about this long and hard. Are there things you'd like to change? For you never know how much time is left that can still be rearranged. If we, could just if we could just slow down enough to consider what true and real and always try to understand the way other people feel and be less quick to anger and show appreciation more and live the people in our lives like we've never loved before. If we treat each other with respect and more often wear a smile, remembering that this special dash 
might only last a little while. So when your eulogy is being read, with your life's actions to rehash, would you be proud of the things they say about how you spent your day? Let's pray. God, thank you again. You're a merciful and mighty God. God, again, I just thank you for being at this appointed place at this appointed time. And God, you know what lays ahead for everyone. We certainly don't. God, I just pray today that we would be faithful to the end. I pray when my time comes that someone might be able to stand up and say the same thing about me that I just said about Miss Jean. She fought the fight. She finished. And there's a place laid up for her, and she's there now waiting on us in a total different setting, in a total different body than she's ever experienced before. So God, encourage us in that. Help us to be faithful in our witness as Miss Jean did for many years of her life. To accomplish your will here on earth. And God, may we do it with a, a zeal and excitement like we've never had before. For we pray these things in Jesus' name. Just say, Amen. Amen. Granny was a uh, an immensely caring woman who loved her loved her family very much. Uh, and as Reverend Stewart pointed out, uh, had, had quite the adventurous side as well, which uh, manifests itself in one way uh, with her being a pilot. She got a big kick out of getting up in those planes and loved to tell stories about it. And uh, this poem Mom and Aunt Billy came up with. Uh, they found somewhere that is kind of a tribute to that adventurous side of Granny. I'm going to try to stump through it with y'all real quick. Okay? It's called High Flight. Oh, I have slipped the surly bonds of earth and danced the skies on laughter's silver wings. Sunward I've climbed and joined the tumbling mirth of sun-split clouds and done a hundred things. You have not dreamed of, wheeled and soared and swung, high in the sunlit silence, hovering there, I've chased the shouting wind alone and flung my eager craft through footless halls of air. Up, up the long delirious burning blue, I've topped the windswept heights with easy grace. Where never lark or even eagle flew. And while with silent lifting mind I've tried the high untrespassed sanctity of space, put out my hand and touch the face of God. <laughs> Uh, when, when we found out that you know, Granny wasn't really doing well, um, and she's had different bouts you know, throughout the years, as many of you know, but got the call that it was looking like this was, this was probably going to be it. Uh, rushed over to Tallahassee and thank, thank the Lord we were able to be there in time to spend some last moments with it. But in the aftermath of it, and just thinking about you know, her life and what she meant to all of us, everybody in this room, including me. I felt touched to uh, to do a song. It's a song that a, a friend of my parents and probably many of you know, his name is David Davis. He wrote this song years ago, a tremendous songwriter. Um, probably won't be able to do it justice, but I felt it on my heart to do it. Um, it's called The Promise Song, and to me it's, you know, God is promising us that if we will put our faith our trust, our hope, and live our lives for Him, He will have His way. And He's had His way today. I mean, that, this is the culmination. It's a celebration of a culmination of her life on this earth, and we're here mourning it, but the, the reality is they're celebrating her in heaven now. And we'll all get to see her one day again.
blood I have purchased you. This gene to most of you was green. Mm -hmm. And despite all of the things that she had been through, we didn't do particularly the last decade or so. She always maintained a sense of humor, and that was my favorite thing about her. And definitely the thing that I miss the most. She loved when we picked on her. And she loved to pick back. <laughs> Always had something slick <laughs> and fly to say in her pocket. You never knew what was going to come out. And I love that. My husband and I got married in 2009 and the lady that arranged our shower had sent in the invitation a blank recipe card for everyone to write down a family recipe that we could start our collection with. And Granny, of course, was there. And I was going through all of them at the shower and came to Greeny. And I don't really recall her cooking all that much through the years, so I was kind of curious as to what her recipe was going to be. And if you know Granny, you know that she enjoyed a good cheeseburger. And her favorite was from Whataburger. And she was with me many, many times that I took her to Whataburger, and she wanted you to order it. Very, very well done. If you had to say, very, very well done, she would make you say it. So, I can't tell you how many times I went and I just got to where I would say, I'd like a cheeseburger burnt. <laughs> that's how she wanted it. No peach whatsoever. So, we were going through the recipes and this is great recipe. Two tiers of embrasing. Drive to a Whataburger <laughs> shop. The nearest one is on South Monroe. Purchase two large burgers with cheese, onions, bacon, and dill pickles. Very, very well done. 
<laughs> Add two orders of onion rings and your favorite sodas. Enjoy. <laughs> <laughs> and this is just, it just speaks volumes. <laughs> I know it's very simple, but it's precious to me. <laughs> I understand her statement well, well done. <laughs> Let's go to the Lord and pray. Our Heavenly Father, again we rejoice. We rejoice, Heavenly Father, that there are no more tremors, no more pain, no more sorrow, no more heartaches. Father, just the joy of running down the streets of with a glorified body that you have provided for us. With eyes that sparkle and twinkle with the love of Jesus. A heart, Father, that is filled with adoration and praise to the God that she has worshipped all this years. Father, from what we've heard, she's probably bending the ear about now, sharing a special little story. And maybe just a little bit of wit to see the smile of Christ come upon your face and to lift her heart. So, Father, we pray that you will continue to bless this family. Thank you for their precious, wonderful, grand, and glorious moments that were unique and special to each individual. Thank you for the love that has reached out beyond her family and to the communities, to the lives that she touched as a teacher, and to the lives that she touched as the resident there in Harvard Chapel. Father, we just give you praise in Jesus' name.